So hello everyone. I'm Suzanne Nickham. I'm the current honorary director of Inform and a senior lecturer in religious studies at the Open University. And many of you are regulars here, but just in case, um, Inform is an independent educational charity providing information about minority religions and sects, which is as accurate, up to date, and evidence based as possible. We exist to prevent harm based on misinformation about minority religions by bringing the insights and methods of academic research into the public domain. Inform was founded in 1988 by Professor Eileen Barker at the London School of Economics. And it was with the direct support of the UK Home Office. We moved to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at King's College London in 2018, where we've been happily based ever since. Um, you can email us at inform at kcl.ac.uk um, during or after the seminar if you have thoughts or questions. We'd love to hear any feedback or ideas you have, what we could do better, future seminar topics, questions about minority religions. Um, very happy to hear from you. So um, the format of this online seminar is based on the successful approach pioneered by Professor Barker um, in our old face-to-face -face seminars, which we used to do on Saturdays. Um, and the point is to try to bring people from a variety of personal and professional experiences who all have a shared interest on a theme to do with minority religions um, that is relevant um, to, to new and minority religions. And so just get them in the same room and talking with each other. And it tends to have a slight academic bias, but we try hard to make space for practitioners and people who have a variety of reasons to engage with either the issue and or the groups in question to talk to each other and, and really understand where everyone's coming from. Um, and we also try to get academics talking more directly in dialogue to the people they study and the people their research affects in various ways. So we will be recording this session. Um, it'll be primarily in speaker view and we will make it available on YouTube afterwards. Um, we'll take questions from the audience at the end. So we'll go through each of the speakers in turn for about 10 minutes. Um, at the end, to ask a question, please type in the chat box um, or put your hand up. Either It's better if you can do it virtually, um, but I'll try to keep an eye up for um, real hands in the screen as well and then we can um, turn your microphone on for you to speak your question and i'll try to get as many questions in as possible if you want to ask a question anonymously you can direct message me suzanne newcomb on zoom you, you kind of pull down rather than messaging everyone and if you just direct message me i'll ask your question without saying who it came from and that won't be recorded anywhere um, your name um, and the participants list won't be on the internet each speaker is going to have about 10 minutes for their section, and if a speaker goes on for too long, um, Anna or I will interrupt you to wrap things up. Um, so please don't take offence. Um, another small announcement is um, Dr. Abel Ugba, um, who is in sociology and social policy at the University of Leeds. Um, we're looking forward to hearing him talk about challenges to religious authorities in Africa and the diaspora in the social media era. Um, he unfortunately is ill and wasn't able to make it today and we wish him uh, a quick recovery and hope to collaborate again with him soon in future. So today it is my pleasure to introduce our um, online seminar on new religions and new media curated by Anna Kira Hippert. Anna joined Inform as an intern in April 2021. Um, she's a candidate for a PhD at um, series, the Centre for Religions, Religious Studies in Bochum, Germany. Um, she has a background in art history and has a master's degree in the study of religion, in which she studied cowboy um, churches in Kansas, which um, made me very happy. Her PhD study, though, is focusing on new religious movements and their uh, media self-presentation via images on websites and the connections between online and offline presentations and she's been a great help as an intern at Inform. And I will hand over for, to her to, to introduce the theme of today's seminar and um, then her presentation formal. So, Anna. 
Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah, yes, I would also like to warmly welcome you to uh, today's seminar. So I'm delighted to see so many of you here in virtual attendance this evening. So and I'm especially delighted to see some of my students here who are in the final stages of the semester, but still made it. So I really appreciate that. And it's it's well noted. Um, and of course, also like to thank Inform for the opportunity to co-host the seminar. Thank you. But coming back to the seminar, as you all know, today's seminar is about media in the context of new religion, a topic that is becoming increasingly important, particularly in modernity. Hence, media does not only function as a mirror of social processes, but as a medium of communication, it also shapes the social perception and thus the discourse on religion. The latter is not new and was already noted by the Spanish American sociologist Jose Casanova with the theory of public religion in 1994. However, not only does religion enter the public sphere via media, but minority religions in particular use media very effectively. I will discuss this in my presentation in a moment, especially in regard to images. Um, but I'm also, of course, looking forward to all the presentations today so we can discuss the following questions among others together. What role does the visual have on contemporary religious identification and practice? What can we learn about new media and new religion from studying the imagery they employ? How does the imagery in virtual forums relate to embodied and material experience, protest, activism, and real world choices? Yeah, thank you everybody for being here. So I think I'll share my screen for my presentation. Yeah, I hope you can, you can all see it. So I will structure my short presentation as follows. First, I will give a very short introduction to image research. Then I will demonstrate how important media and images are in the discourse around NRMs, followed by the potential of media and the image research regarding NRMs. Finally, I will briefly outline the research topic I am concerned with in my dissertation and what I would like to contribute to the topic of images, media, and NRMs in the academic discourse. So, Looking at images, in the course of the formation of the new mediality, modernity, and the extensive use of mass media, the medium of images have also become highly relevant. Images, along with the language, are among the most important sign mediating instruments of representation, interpretation, and appropriation of the world, as Stöck and Klemm state in their book. The German art historian Gottfried Böhm stated in 2012 that images are significant means of representation. As such, they play into what he calls a closely linked triad of presentation, representation, and presence. From a hermeneutical perspective, he also argues that images can be strong, in as much as they engage in a metabolism with reality, making them an, an, making them an integral part of society and create reality. According to the philosopher Bernard Waldenfels, it could also be that images have a special efficacy. In agency, in Germany, we call that a Wirkmacht that evokes response by the viewer. The art historian Horst Bredekamp even emphasized that images can have an impact on the viewer and execute an interpretive power upon them. So we all know the saying power of images or the slightly polemic version that images manipulate us or are used for brainwashing. This efficacy is particularly important in the digital age where floods of images reach a new quantity and quality. This is also argued for by the scholars Boom and William Mitchell, who initiated the pictorial turn or iconic turn that began in the 1990s. By turning to visual science, scientific rationality was established through the analysis of images. In the study of religion, the art historian and scholar of religion David Morgan and the anthropologist and scholar of religion Birgit Meyer have been influential concerning images related to religion. Morgan, for example, argues for the acknowledgement of their importance. He is primarily concerned with the function and effect images have on the viewer. His theory of images describes that images can pursue or influence the viewer in a selective way. The result of his historical study showed that images seemingly depict a truth in the eyes of the believer, but cannot actually depict a truth. For example, we don't know what Jesus looked like. We only know, of course, the image of him. Maya addresses images and other media as sensational forms. That means that worship images such as icons in church can help petitioners experience the presence and power of the transcendental through those images. 
So this is image theory in short. Reality shows, however, that precisely because of the late turn to images in relation to society and especially religion, many phenomena concerning imagery have not yet been examined in detail. The lack of research on images in regard to NRMs, for example, might stem from the fact that the establishment of NRM research was closely connected what Eileen Barker termed cult wars. These needed to be in a way resolved first to pave the way for more socio sociological theories and ethnographies within the field of NRMs. So nevertheless, the media and especially images have always been part of the discourse around new religious movement and have strongly influenced it. So we remember the 1970s when Charles Manson and the People's Temple tragedy in particular became headline stories. So, I have brought a few newspaper clippings here on the slide, which some of you might recall from the past. We often read about the rather negative portrayal of NRMs in the media and academia, but it is a different experience when we explicitly look at these images on newspapers and the discourse becomes visible. That's what images do, they make something visible. So um, here we see articles in which especially the image text relationship seems important. For example, on the right clip, we have a picture of Charles Manson and above the words, this is the man they call Satan. Through this image text relationship, it becomes quite clear who he is. In a sense, the text tells me how to read the image. But it's not only the press or antagonists as the German cultural scholar Gerald Willems describes them that use media and discourse, discourse, but also new religious movements themselves. Since especially by the turn of the millennial, media and images have become increasingly important for many movements, such as the Church of Scientology, Jehovah's Witness, ISKCON, etc. Particularly, the internet is used by NRMs for their purpose not only to provide information about their beliefs and practices, but also to provide opportunities to promote courses, literature, and all kinds of material. The latter was already stated by Barker in 2005. Lewis and Tollefson even called some new religious movements early adapters of technology because they were born in an age when the use of media was already widespread and they were not forced to adapt as an ethnic Catholic church or other established religions. The above, however, refers predominantly to the macro level. On the micro level, websites and integrated images also offer a great deal of potential that can provide sociological insights about individual movements. Because beyond the distribution of information and the marketing of all kinds of material, there's also a very strong emphasis on a professional web layout, as well as visual material, among other things, happy groups of people in bright colors, who seem to dominate the web presence of many NRM websites. So here, I brought various examples of movements that flood the websites with such cheerful images. Among them are the Church of Scientology, you can see them on the left, is gone, the LDS church and the Uralian movement. Especially with regard to what Weidenfeld stated that images have an efficacy, it can be assumed that internet presentations of NRMs with embedded photographs are much more than a tool for selling literature, etc. It can be assumed that images or happy crowds, or for example, at the celebration of the Church of Scientology or at the celebration of the Uralian movement are used to transmit in a sense of Weber, communal relationship, Vergemeinschaftung, partaking a salvation, for example, to existing and potential new members. Among other things, this could ensure dynamics and cohesion among members and loyalty to the NRMs. So, this hypothesis as a basic assumption in mind, as well as the image theories of Bredekamp, Böhm, Meyer, and Morgan, which postulates an efficacy of images, I intend with my dissertation project to examine the function of images and to expand the discourse on NRMs, media, and images. And I do that with the following research question. What functions do media, especially images, have in regulating media discourse on religion in the US? The aim is to determine which, which possible science systems and patterns of interpretation new religious movements have developed via website and especially integrated photographs in order to first generate a media image that may influence the social view on MRMs and change their internal impact, external impact. Simultaneously, second, I will examine how this interacts with the group itself to create and maintain a sense of community and to acquire new members. 
So in order to answer this question, various data material will be used, namely images or screenshots of the website of the respective movements, images found in the respective churches and data collected in the field. So I interviews, pie sorting, group discussions. To answer the initial question, I work comparatively with two case studies that differ in terms of structure and social dynamics and conception of belief. The first case study is the Cowboy Church movement. Cowboy churches are evangelical churches within the Cowboy culture that are distinctively Western heritage and character, as you can all see. Um, a typical cowboy church may meet in a rural setting in a barn, western building, have its own rodeo arena and a country gospel. Despite, and that's important for being evangelical in origin, scholar of religion Mary Dellum in 2018 and I noted in 2021, cowboy churches also have traits of new religious movements. This is mainly due to the fact that the target group is predominantly located in the Midwest and South of America and associates a romanticized popular culture understanding of cowboy with being Christian. This leads to problems concerning the church structure, the hierarchy, expansion, and acceptance of issues in society. They strongly propagate the cowboy lifestyle simultaneously criticizing modern America and exchanges and its changes with modernity. The second case study is the well-known Church of Scientology. I chose it because unlike cowboy churches, the Church of Scientology is consistent and is known to use media and images efficiently. So after evaluating the data from the field, I will generate an image theory that emphasizes the reciprocal dynamics between websites and the embedded images on the one hand and the members of the movements on the other. So as Birgit Meyer has already stated a couple of years ago, conducting research on visual culture requires a continuous cooperation between scholars from a diverse range of disciplines. So I'm therefore delighted to contribute my perspective of a religious studies scholar and art historian to the no doubt insightful discussion tonight. So that's from my side. Fantastic, thank you so much, Anna. Um, if you want to introduce the next speaker, I'll get in the back seat. So now we will hear a highly interesting, I have no doubt, presentation by, Zo by Joseph Schimhardt entitled How Artistic Expression Informs Dialogue for Recovering Ex-Cult Members. He is a member of International Cultic Studies Association, a cult information specialist. He has also become an expert in the field of exit therapy and as the highly sought after consultant. He has made numerous media appearances and has been a consultant for major network news programs such as CNN, Dateline, and NBC. He also is the author of the book Center Fear, Bill Tate, and Me, How an Artist Become a Cult Interventionist. So what, what will be, I think, particularly interesting concerning his presentation is, is another perspective on the subject of Im images and especially art. While my presentation referred more to the antagonists and NRMs themselves who use media, Joseph Smart will focus on ex-members. So it's your turn. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm gonna cover three uh, points uh, briefly. Uh, one is the uh, International Cultic Studies Association Phoenix Project, which they've uh, uh, set up for uh, ex-members to exhibit their art. Uh, the next point uh, would be the aesthetics of uh, media influence and how I see that. And the last one is the dangers and, and what can happen uh, when someone uses the media effectively. <clears throat> Yeah, so during the past decades, recovering ex-members felt safe displaying their art, poetry, plays, and music at ICSA conferences where they could get sympathetic feedback. Uh, one of the uh, magazines, ICSA Today, uh, in 2017, put this out. This is one of my paintings. I have a degree from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. I've been an artist uh, selling work since the early 1970s. And this is one of my paintings called Trust in the... In the front of this uh, particular magazine. Inside this magazine is an article called Retribing the Planet, Shamanism Repurposed for Modern Times. And in it, I look at um, cults, if you will, that are, or pseudo-shamanic groups and uh, their effect on, on people. And one of the ex-members that I helped was involved in this kind of group for about 10 years up in the Vancouver Islands. And this is one of her paintings that you see here. 
uh, let me get it, uh, that she exhibited at the Phoenix Project. So you get an idea of an ex-member exhibiting her emotional uh, reaction to her art. She's also a silversmith and was affiliated with one of the uh, native tribes up there in uh, Vancouver Island. So uh, that's just a little sample of what happens at the Phoenix Project uh, where people can uh, exhibit their work. I'm on the committee to help uh, arrange and, and select that kind of uh, display. So second, I look at, want to look at the aesthetics of the media influence. Um, I got into a new religious movement called Church Universal and Triumphant, uh, and which is based somewhat on theosophy through aesthetics, through my artwork. I was studying the work of uh, Kandinsky, Kupka, Mondrian, who were all influenced by theosophy early in their careers. And I went down that rabbit hole, ended up in uh, pursuing Church Universal and Triumphant for about a year and a half as my uh, current religion at the time. I got out in 1980 and then began my career researching and helping other people with that kind of problem. So basically what I see this as from an aesthetic point of view, I, I believe that uh, um, art, uh, that, anyway, I, I see art as a language and language depends on both context and medium for meaning. And I'm going back to Marshall McLuhan, 1967, the medium is the massage where he discusses how the medium itself changes the meaning. It's not just the content. And I think he was quite prescient in what's happening today in, in our explosion of, of media influences. Um, and I also looked at uh, uh, how McLuhan's analysis uh, uh, has the medium as an extension of the artist's senses. Um, you can find some of this in Heidegger, um, he called uh, tech, this kind of media that's out there, standing reserve that we can enter our personalities into this tech and it, it becomes us uh, through our expression. Um, so yeah, I kind of look at the whole problem of new religions from an aesthetic viewpoint, being an artist and, and how that affects us. And third, the dangers. Um, one of the dangers I noticed today among recovering ex-members and cult experts uh, is the temptation to create a cult following or subscribers with social media, creating a feedback loop dependency or obsession that can impede open discussion. In other words, it can become a closed uh, system all in on its, in a, of itself. Um, one of the earliest groups to utilize the media effectively, uh, one might call a new religious movement, but he was anti-religion, so you might call him a new anti-religious movement. And that was by this guy, Stefan Molyneux, or Free Domain Radio. He started podcasting in 2004 uh, from Canada. Uh, members rarely saw him, so he was kind of a Wizard of Oz on the screen, uh, spouting his version of philosophy, uh, something that he called anarcho-capitalism. A lot of what his philosophy was based on was Ayn Rand and uh, individualism or her objectivism. Uh, he, he promotes white supremacy. Uh, he also def uh, promoted something called defooing, which was defect from family of origin. And he believed that uh, all parents abused their children and raising them, they didn't know how to do it. And therefore he convinced young college students which comprised about maybe 75% of his audience uh, to completely cut their families off. And uh, naturally I started getting phone calls back in the day uh, from many, many different families wondering uh, why their children, adult children weren't talking to them. And we did some interventions regarding uh, Molyneux. Um, he was banned from, uh, as it's, he posted here in this, you can see he's, he's banned from YouTube. And he says, no surrender. He was also banned from Twitter back in 2020 for his radical white supremacist and uh, kind of conspiratorial views. He became a, a speaker among alt-right circles, um, which you all know about uh, in the United States. So, so that's one of the dangers that can come from this. He, he has posted thousands of podcasts uh, over the years. And again, his members rarely see him, yet he has quite an influence over them. For instance, um, you could become something called a philosopher king if you sub, uh, supported him with about 50 to $75 a month uh, for his enterprise. Um, so it's quite a title. Um, one of the other things I noticed is that immersive theater is being used quite a bit to influence people, not only for entertainment, but for 
messaging. And uh, I, I got to look at immersive theater closely. One of my daughters, Anna, is involved in a uh, immersive theater called Cages out in Los Angeles for the past two years. She has a role in this. And, and it's an interesting uh, immersive theater in that the theme is about a state or a uh, country called Anadonia in which no one is allowed to express their emotion or fall in love. And in order to break free from that, from this said cult, uh, uh, there's a couple of characters which learn how to love. And uh, it's coming to the UK, by the way, to London uh, next from out of Los Angeles. So you might want to take in cages. It has a th part of the theme is this cult thing and uh, how that works. And it's quite well done. Um, yeah. so. I think that's about all I want to say uh, in this. I'll just hang around for questions and uh, I'll go from there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the fascinating, fascinating presentation and the insights of your work. Um, I think this has once again shown what other function images and especially art can have. So our next speaker is Jacqueline Hagwies. She's project consultant for yoga studies online at SOAS University of London. She researches the contemporary meeting place between historical practices and their application in modern environment. She holds a bachelor of engineering from the Uni University of NSW. She's also a founding member and online editor of the Journal of Yoga Studies. So as you can already tell from her biography, Jacqueline Hagri's talk will give us another insight into a highly interesting topic. Her contribution, image of the yogi representation, communication and commodification of yoga in a visual form complements, I guess, the previous presentation wonderfully. After all, we should not forget that especially the representation of yoga in the media has increased extremely and has also influenced its practice especially in modernity where the religious landscape has become highly individualized as Lukman describes it, yoga experience a strong popularization. So I'm very curious what you will share with us. Thank you very much. And I'm going to share a presentation. So I'll pull that up now and hopefully go to full screen. So are you seeing that? Yeah, okay. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to thank INFORM for convening this uh, very innovative seminar, uh, in particular Dr. Suzanne Newcomb for him, her invitation to present, and also for Anna uh, for her insights throughout the program. So my name is Jacqueline Hargreaves, and I'll be attempting to interrogate the visual culture of yoga on social media under the title of Image of a Yogi. I thought that I should preface this presentation by stating that I'm not a religious studies scholar, However, I will be speaking from a position of both an educator, a yoga teacher, a curator, and a collaborator on a number of yoga-focused academic projects. Uh, given the time constraints, our 10-minute window, I, I will be limiting my discussion to two areas of interest in this complex area of study. Firstly, the enduring and sometimes contradictory representations of the yoga as an accomplished one. And then secondly, the vibrant intersections between yoga and activism. So to begin uh, the accomplished one, uh, I thought I'd start with a little bit of history as in pre-modern times, efforts have been made by visual artists to capture and express what it means to be an accomplished one. One who has succeeded in their pursuit of liberation from worldly bonds, um, eternal suffering or perhaps escaped um, rebirth. For example, in early Shramana traditions, such as Buddhism, we see ideological ideas and teachings being communicated through sculpture, where, for example, here the Buddha is represented as, as absence or a vacant seat, or perhaps as imprints of footprints left behind where attempts to represent the physical body are completely disregarded. In an example from Jainism, the naked sky-clad mendicant of Jainism stands predominantly uh, permanently still in his upright standing posture made of brass, having transcended the bonds of karma through complete detachment. In later traditions, Tantra and Hatha Yoga, for example, attempt to represent the accomplished one 
either as a, a meditator, perhaps. In this case, if we look at the image on the right, uh, we have an accomplished tantric yogi seated comfortably, absorbed in meditation with his eyes appearing half open, half closed, and the subtle, subtle inner world that he is visualizing as chakras and deities represented along the spine as if tattooed on the skin. In contrast, the uh, image on the left, the accomplished sadhu who has mastered the breath through pranayama breathing exercises defies gravity and is depicted levitating above his tiger skin mat, thus demonstrating his supernatural attainments through his adept practice. As we move to the era of contemporary yoga and, as, and its manifest manifestations in visual form on social media, the theme of the accomplished one endures. However, as expected, the meaning of what it is to be an accomplished one can diverge and the purpose and practice be reinterpreted. The seated down here on the far right is probably one that is most enduring, um, the posture, Padmasana, uh, dictates those who have achieved this state of meditation. However, when we look here at this pr practitioner sitting comfortably in meditation, the backdrop is the tranquil beach, an idealized location. The striking distinction to past traditions is the use of the hashtag stronger mind, stronger body, in which the purpose of the practice is explicitly stated as physical attainments. An example of levitation seen on the left um, is also represented, but rather than demonstrating the skills attained through cities or supernatural powers, this particular practitioner is assisted by props within a yoga studio. The top left here, the woman we see standing absorbed in meditation, hashtag Tadasana or the standing mountain pose, is not unlike the Jane mendicant. However, rather than naked, she is clad in garments that some may argue express cultural appropriation. She adorns her body with feathers and beads of the indigenous Native Americans. On the other side, we see the visual visualized chakras of, um, of Tantra are no longer appear as uh, those accomplished by the mind of, an, of a meditator, but rather can be purchased and worn as a t-shirt. One of the more complex areas of yogins uh, expressing themselves online is the willingness for those who are accomplished in their practice to use their physical attainments to sell products. Here in the caption reads, even if we see, even if the sea dries up and the mountain wears down, love will live forever in the infinite universe. However, right below these words and written immediately um, with blue hearts, is an endorsement for the product. This yogini uh, points to the brand of the uh, bikini that she's wearing in meditation. Uh, the environment of teacher and student is uh, not immune to this uh, phenomena. Here we have a, a space for creating and sharing yogic teachings, and it is often described as a sacred space. If we read the, um, the caption for this particular image, it states, the Mysore room is a sacred space. One, it's on days when it's so quiet that there's only the sound of the breath, it feels like communal prayer. For so many sincere practitioners, this is our church. But once again, directly below uh, this sort of um, religious statement, we find an endorsement for her classes and also a link to up and coming workshops. The view that the studio space is a safe and sacred space is not shared by all on social media. The era um, of social media has enabled teaching pedagogy to be questioned and practitioners intersecting with teachers through their physical adjustments has been fiercely critiqued through debates, forcing change in this area through education of consent, trauma-informed practices, survivor, a victim survivor activism and advocacy and Me Too movement. 
Instagram's digital cool toolkit has provided the perfect visual, visual device for capturing the perseverance and the dexterity of the modern contemporary practitioner. With reels of effortless flow between complex postural forms, the modern practitioner can express their frustrations, courage, methods and daily lessons to a worldwide audience. Nonetheless, these accomplishments may be framed within a God-given practice. For example, here we see stated, I asked for strength and, and God gave me difficulties to make me strong, etc., etc. However, my prayers were answered and the prayers were answered obviously uh, through not obtaining the realm of the God or becoming God-like, but rather the accomplished practitioner is granted wisdom through their strength, strength and perseverance on the mat. I'd like to conclude this first section by saying, stating that um, it's important to highlight that given the global success of transnational yoga, we often find the accomplished one has different manifestations on digital platforms depending on their cultural specific um, environment. I highlighted just a couple here. Um, the first on the left here being the embodiment of purity and fairness of skin captured in the form of the white cloth yin yoga practitioner, uh, particularly aimed at the Southeast Asian and Chinese market. The top right, the electronic savvy and digitally hip sound of the remastered Japanese market where they incorporate um, music festivals with the Japanese um, practitioner. And then finally, uh, the bottom right here, we have indigenous music and sacred journeys of the South American market um, combining with indigenous knowledge of healing. I, um, one point I wanted to make, which I think uh, Joseph also mentioned was that the media or the medium can change over time. And this actually dictates the top content. And um, if I, before I appear too harsh in my criticism of contemporary yogas depicting themselves on social media, I thought it was worth noting that the medium in which yoga has been captured and depicted over time has evolved. And the enduring quality of stone in the early period has ensured that yogas are captured on the walls of temples and city gates as early as the 13th century. Manuscripts in, medieval period, in the medieval period have provided words to describe the techniques that we see depicted as images, um, as static postures on temple walls or painted on manuscript folios. However, in the contemporary time, we're, we're finding that the medium of film and photography is, is affecting how we are able to engage with the yoga practice. So my question, I guess, would be, um, would yogins of the past have jumped at the opportunity to capture their practice on film and publish it on social media in an Instagram square of 180 by 180 uh, pixels? And my answer would probably be a affirming yes. So the final area that I'd like to cover very briefly is the intersections of yoga with activism. Um, uh, Activism and its intersections with yoga on social media is a flourishing space and it's where we actually see quite distinct changes in the practice itself. If we look here at disability and adaptive active activists, um, we find that uh, practice is being accommodated or um, formed, formulated for accessibility, wheelchair yoga, self-love, and these um, hashtags are used not only for activists if, of disability, but they have some crossover with those who are body, body positive activists. So um, yoga community uh, includes those that are looking at uh, curvy yoga, fat girl yoga, fat fitness or body inclusivity, um, including things like F your body standards, which are trying to reshape society's view on what it means to be fat and fabulous. Interestingly for me, because I look at pre-modern yoga in particular, um, is this intersection with black advocates where black yoga teachers feel the need to take back a practice, which was really an, um, an indigenous practice to India. Here we find hashtags of women of color 
and um, Black Lives Matter, self-love and yoga community, all being shared amongst um, Black yoga teachers and Black yogis, in particular those of sisters of the yoga, sisters of yoga. The final area of activism I'd like to highlight is that of gender diversity, in which queer yoga, yoga is activated as political and it is intersects with teachers who identify as trans. So it also covers this idea of yoga for all and yoga for community and gay yoga. One um, quote I'd like to take is from a practitioner teacher in Australia, Matthew Bergen, who identifies as queer, who recently ran an in-person um, a very popular practice at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney. In fact, it was one of the biggest events they'd had all year. And he describes his, um, on, on social media, he advertised his practice as part new age spiritual enema and bent to future queer survivalist guide, a trip to the limerence journey, journeys deep into the body's hormonal makeup and targets toxic limiting beliefs such as queer shame and internalized homophobia. A trip to limerence uses the healing powers of meditation, mindfulness and music to extract the chemicals of love, self-acceptance and joyfulness. I would like to end with a, a, a nod, if you like, to influencers who are attempting to debunk some of the sort of more common memes that we see shared across the space, not just in a yoga world, but rather more broadly in the community, where things like um, we see pictures of the Buddha with statements such as everything that surrounds you is temporary, only love is your heartbeat, for example, it lives on in your heart, um, where it has no historical reference at all to traditions of yoga or Buddhism. Um, whereas in the uh, current online space, we're finding an intersection between academic scholarship and that of um, social media, where recent translations on textual histories combining with the open access availability of images made possible by institutions such as British Museum, British Library, MIT, and so forth, so are allowing these images to be accessed and published worldwide um, um, uh, under Creative Commons. Uh, this is influencing our ability to share uh, educa more edu educationally informed uh, meanings, if you like, uh, in this space. So thank you all very much. That's the end of my presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation. Many of these images are also in my Instagram feed, and I think this shows how, how, how current this topic of yoga online is and what flood of images really means. Like when you scroll through your feed and you see all those images. Um, the next presentation we will hear is called Faith Folk at the Far Right, Visual Cultures of Anti-Racist Heathenry on Instagram. This will be presented by Dr. Robert J. Wallace. He's staff tutor in art history at the Open University and holds a PhD archaeology he earned at the University of Southampton. Dr. Wallace's research interest lies in the archaeology and anthropology of art and religion. He focuses on prehistoric art, shamanism, animism, and their interface with modern and contemporary art, the uses of heritage by today's pagans, and the earliest evidence for falconry and human raptor sociality. So, and as you can see or guess from the title of his presentation, the focus, like the one of Jacqueline Hargreaves, is the medium Instagram. And I, I would like you to all to, 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 remind, to remember the social media network Instagram founded in 2010 is one of the most important tools when it comes to the distribution of images. We should really not forget that. There's probably no other medium with such a high flood of images, as I already said before, as Instagram and no other medium that influences new religion alongside websites as much as Instagram. So I'm really excited uh, what function inter Instagram has in the anti-racist heathenry debate. So it's your turn. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I should point out from the start that this presentation includes images that some viewers may find offensive. So I want to start with this slide of Wayland Smithy Longbarrow, 
um, the facade of Wayland Smithy, which is um, an neolithic long barrow in Oxfordshire. Um, and juxtaposed with a quote from the historian Ronald Hutton, Wayland Smithy is a site of ongoing controversy because a number of far right racist heathen groups, including Woden's folk, have conducted rituals there and caused damage to the site in recent years. Heathenry has a long historical association with far right politics extending back into the late 19th century, but my interest here, of course, is in how anti racist heathens are responding on social media to racist heathenry and especially through means of Instagram visual means on Instagram. Um, the second image you can see of Waylands there is from the Wild Hunt blog, um, which was outlining some of these recent racist heathen interactions at the site. So very swiftly, heathenry is a specific contemporary pagan path drawing on historical, literary and archaeological evidence of the pagan polytheistic past in Northwestern Europe, encompassing Norse, Germanic and Anglo-Saxon sources. And so it is a part of the contemporary pagan movement, which I don't have any further time to go into. A typical heathen ritual, which might be performed at a site like Wayland Smithy or another location deemed appropriate is the bloat, literally a sacrifice, which today is read as a ceremony honoring the gods involving the share of drink, often alcohol and food with one another, with the deities and with the spirits of the land here at Thingvellir in Iceland and in the Peak District, the remains of an offering in England. It's important to state that the majority of heathens are known as universalist and inclusivist, welcoming all those interested in the religious path, whatever their background. So they predominantly aim to be non-discriminatory in terms of age, disability, gender, race, sexual orientation, or religious belief. And this is made clear here on the Alsotru UK Facebook site, the largest group in the UK with three and a half thousand plus followers. Um, and also on the UK Heathenry website, a, a smaller private group with a smaller number of members. Um, and just to note here in their restrictions on membership that the term race is in scare quotes to emphasize this is a constructed contested term. On the other side of the spectrum, there are two main far right racist groups in the UK. Um, the Odinic right founded in 1973, though its name and form has morphed into the current organization over the years since, and which has a strong presence in the US as well. Obviously, I don't have time to go into the US situation here, although some of the Instagram images are probably from the US. The second group is Woden's Folk, founded in 1988 with a stronger focus on English identity. So both are folkish, neo-volkish, ethnicist, or more simply racist, in limiting their membership to white individuals in their belief that heathenry is the ancestral religion of the people of England and of Northern Indo-Europeans more broadly. The banner at the top of the slide is from the Odinic Rite website. The text also from their website below makes their racism clear, claiming to hold an indigenous religion of Northern Indo-European ancestors. Their main graphic symbol, the triskel of three F Fehu runes first rune of the Germanic runic script incorporates the terms faith, folk and family. Their account of it in the text on the right reiterates the importance of blood and bloodline to their understanding of Odinism and the colouring of black, red and white, of course, references Nazi and neo-Nazi insignia. Woden's folk also reference such insignia with their use of the wolf's angel symbol at the centre of the slide formerly used by several SS battalions during World War II. The language on their website, folkish heathenism, being proud of land, folk and blood, also marks the organization as racist. Many heathen groups across the spectrum from universalist to racist have Facebook accounts and websites, but Instagram of course is very different as a photo sharing social networking service and hashtagging taxonomy were instantly sharing ideas via image and text and gaining a following in order to further spread your influence. In terms of social 
social scalability. It is, as argued by the UCL project, why we post the most public social media platform. And so posts potentially capture the largest group of people. So this research, I think, is timely in terms of Bennett and Wilkins's 2020 article, Viking Tattoos of Instagram, as, quote, a cultural moment when self-perception and social relations have become increasingly embedded in social media. It's also a moment of smartphone mediated religion, quote, as Fuchs puts it in her 2019 book, Anthropological Perspectives on the Religious Uses of Mobile Apps. And as Danny Miller says, smartphone mediated religion is, quote, coming to epitomize 21st century religion. Moreover, issues of race have become increasingly prominent during the decade plus of Instagram's existence with the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement and increasing prominence of a decolonizing agenda. So this is an opportune time to analyze four specific hashtags by which Instagrammers organize, search for, and follow content. These are heathens against hate, heathens against racism, heathens united against racism, and pagan Antifa. I'm going to start with Heathens Against Hate, which has 4.2 thousand plus posts, and the five images you see here offer a good snapshot of what's posted. I don't have time to go into all of these, of course. So a text-heavy example, top, top, top center, is in simple black text on a white background with three motifs often used by racist groups. The Valknut symbol associated with the god Odin, the hammer of God Thor called Mjolnir and the Odal or Othala rune, all three here highlighted in the post as appropriated and misused by racists. The image shows a heavy use of text, but most Instagrammers prefer simpler imagery reserving text for the hashtags because simpler uses of images are known to get more followers. Take the example bottom right, which shows a gold hammer of Thor upon the gay pride flag, the rainbow colors reflecting the diversity of the LGBTQI community and the spectrum of human sexuality in, and gender, insisting that inclusivist heathens too welcome all. The accompanying hashtag, which I've chosen to include here, which is anonymized for ethical reasons from an Instagrammer, includes inclusive heathenry as a hashtag. Heathens against racism has 1,000 plus posts. One of these has a green leaf background emphasizing heathenry's link, links to and respect for nature with the statement heathens against racism in English in the center with certain letters also composed of bind runes, that is combining runes together for amplified magical purposes. These bind runes within the circle of the entire rune row, the futhark itself, held by some heathens as a magical formula or charm of making, indicates that the entire post is a magical act in itself to counter racist heathenry. The, black, the image with Black Lives Matter juxtaposes the English text with runic script on a hammer, which translates as Mjolnir, i.e. Thor's hammer, held within a fist of many skin colours. The text accompanying the image states, Odin is the all father, not the some father, a phrase repeated often by anti-racist heathens on social media in a reclaiming of this God from Odinists who interpret the God often in racist terms. And the hashtags, as you can say here, again, anonymized, uh, include heathens against hate, for example. The uh, final two hashtags I want to talk about have many fewer posts, but they're visually so interesting, I think it's important to include them and uh, they potentially have much more influence as a result of their simplicity. Um, okay, so posts on Heathens United Against Racism, uh, which Heathens Against, as with Heathens, Heathens Against Hate, I should say, is an organization, um, not just a hashtag includes a simple black and white image of Adolf Hitler performing a Nazi salute, his head being smashed like glass by Thor's hammer, rather than destroying a Jotun or giant, the chief enemy of the gods in Norse mythology. Here, this hammer destroys the architect of Nazi rhetoric and its legacy 
in the present. In a very different use of Thor's hammer on the right, a photograph of a textile patch sewn into clothing, which shows a hammer with a rainbow of colors in interlace, reference, referencing the LGBTQTI rainbow with the accompanying text, no Nazis in Valhalla, in a reclaiming of the mythological hall of fallen warriors away from the far right to within an inclusive heathenry. A message here can be identified that all are welcome in Valhalla. Finally, two examples of posts from the hashtag Pagan Antifa, again showing the simple use of text and image in order to maximize the impact of the messaging. The one showing Mjolnir above large sensory font in capitals stating boldly, this hammer smashes fascists. It has a poster or t-shirt style aesthetic, while the second on the right strikes through the Nazi black sun symbol with DIY punk-like no entry red daubing. The text stating eclipse the effing sun with an anarchist A emblazoned top left and a number of runes in the image, which would be readable to those with some elementary knowledge. The three arrow shaped tear runes, two runes, which refer to the God of the same name, repeated three times, magical number in Northern tradition, and pointing at the cancelled sun to maximize the magical impact and bottom left the text reading kill nazis so a very quick conclusion i hope i'm within time to say that i think this heathen anti-racist use of instagram is interesting in in four main respects firstly insta is highly public and has the most reach of all social media platforms in order to maximize on messaging impact so it's a top choice for making protest statements. Second, it shows a highly creative use of text and image using simplicity to maximize the impact of the message. Simple images do best on Instagram. Third, the posts have a clear political message divorced of references to individuals when the majority of other posts on Instagram are apolitical, individualized and using selfies and filters focused on self-presentation and often commodification with the view to invite accolade and sales. So this virtual heathen politicking on Instagram enables anti-racist heathens to attempt to counter racist heathenry, to reclaim images and ideas from ancient sources which have been appropriated by the far right and to reposition them in terms they think are more in tune with past and present heathenry. So that's it. Thank you very much. And this is very much work in progress. So I would really welcome your feedback. Many thanks to you, Dr. Robert J. Wallace, for this fascinating lecture, which indeed gave interesting insights regarding heathenry on Instagram. Um, our next presentation is called Muslim Women Creating the Self Online by Renasha Khan. Renasha Khan is a PhD candidate in theology and religious studies and a graduate teaching assistant at King's College London. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in History and History and Development Studies from the School of, Or School of Oriental and African Studies of London. Her research interests include religious studies, sociology, anthropology, digital humanities, gender studies, gender media, contemporary Islam and, and, and intersectional and political science. Um, her presentation, I guess, links the level of levels of religion and gender. Gender and the role of women um, have been increasingly in the focus of academia, ac academic analysis since the 1990s. Media, especially the internet, and I think we are here about that too, are used to challenge stereotypes of women. But women also use media to verify these stereotypes, especially with regard to religion Gender has a spe special significance since gender roles are strongly, strongly regulated in most religions. So I'm curious about the presentation where Islam is the particular focus. Classic, I've not unmuted myself. So um, I'm just gonna share my screen and um, here we go. So everyone should be able to see that. 
that right? That should be in speed yeah. reading, sorry. So lovely. So yeah, as we said, um, my research is looking at uh, millennial Muslim women. So it's quite a wide age birth from 18 to 38, but I'll go into more detail just to quick overview of what we're gonna talk about today, the project, some of my methodology, because I'm using some very mixed methods and also um, innovative methodology, um, combining it with some pretty traditional uh, social science um, methodology and we're going to look at kind of constructions in the media but then also how these are being countered through online and makeshift creativity as I try and kind of theorize it as I'm um, using Michelle Lucetto's theorization so um, essentially this is looking at Muslim women like I said aged 18 to 38. I'm looking at women from the community that I grew up in um, the British Bangladeshi heritage um, group and they're from Tower Hamlets where I was also born so proximity to the um, uh, the sample set is quite close but it's very close but I also grew up outside of Tower Hamlets because I left when I was young and the kind of focus of what my research looks at is uh, selfhood and agency so we're really focusing on how the curate the self is curated online and obviously inherently a part of that for these Muslim women is their religious um, practice as well so um, I'm focusing like we said we've already had something on Instagram which is really rare because it still doesn't seem to count, come up on a lot of academic stuff and Robert's presentation was really fantastic one thing I will say that there's a lot of almost all no all the images that I've used in this um, PowerPoint were sourced off Instagram um, and I've not been able to like none of them some of them are just reproduced images so they don't have any copyrights as neatly as Jackie's had but um uh essentially all the imagery that you see it's super evocative and it's all representative of what is being shared by Muslim women for Muslim women. So when we think about um, being online uh, these are some of the ways in a very broad sweeping way that the women that I spoke to um, which count up to 15 women that I interviewed um, and I'm still talking to as this is like a longitudinal thing that we're doing and I'll be doing focus groups, et cetera. But being in online is a multitude of things and it is essentially comes to um, seeking Islamic knowledge online. And this is actually quite a common thing amongst a lot of young women of varying scales of um, practice and belief. Um, community and understanding one's community, be that as a British Bangladeshi, be that as an East Londoner, um, be that as a Muslim cyclist. Um, community is at the heart of the kind of social media experience. Um, and this also counts for being South Asian women and all the kind of intersections of identities that these women share. Social activism was a common thing, so much that I'm gonna have a whole chapter on it in my thesis um, because political activism and engagement is very high amongst the women that I spoke to and they seem relatively representative of the kind of sense of civic duty that seems to be imbued in a lot of the women that I spoke to. Um, one of the driving forces of like the Islamic internet was modest fashion and makeup and even if you're not someone who's studying it or a Muslim yourself um, what you will be able to see is if you think back to five or seven years ago how many hijabi women you saw on a billboard and now the fact that most of Oxford Street will have a hijabi woman in one or two of their windows. Um, and so it's that kind of proliferation of what people call the Muslim dollar, but the Muslim pound, and this um, but modest fashion and makeup and women-driven content creation is definitely at the heart of the proliferation of um, Islamic online activity. Obviously at the heart of a lot of being online and self-presentation is self-expression. Um, and that has come about itself in very different ways according with my participants. Some people are poets and they share their poetry. Some of them are artists, um, as well as being kind of their professional day jobs, be they as teachers, lawyers, etc. cetera. Um, and some of the things that really came up were these ideas of like idea, advice, support, well-being. Um, and this kind of, and it actually a lot of it taps into kind of syncretic understandings of like kind of new age religions, be it like crystals and witchcraft and horoscopes and kind of almost bringing that into their understanding of um, their Islamic place. 
Um, and also kind of the usual things like travel photos and food photos. So going somewhere nice for food or brunch and taking a photo of it. Um, something that comes up when we're thinking about the defiance of gender roles, um, that is something that is very strongly as a theme that's come up. Um, and everything from like fitness activities to doing things like bodybuilding, for example, but also just simple things that maybe some of us might take for granted, like things like traveling alone and cycling, which are deemed as like traditionally not that acceptable for young women to be doing from our community. And yet a lot of the women that I spoke to are taking heart in that. And their online experience was what, uh, engaged them and gave them place and kind of validity to be able to engage with that, seeing that they're not alone in wanting to kind of divert from traditional stereotypes of activity. So just a quick note on my methodology. And the reason why I'm talking about it is that I've kind of merged really traditional one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews, which I'm sure a lot of you have conducted over the years, um, but also with focus groups and um, observations at community events. So these are kind of like a, a, like galas and mellas, which are kind of very socially me media driven. Um, and a lot of them rotate around Islamic lifestyle. So be that fashion, modest fashion, food, um, and also like the Islamic, uh, Islamic lifestyle in the sense of like marriage and things like that, that, that seem to be happening. And they happen all around the country, but I've been looking at ones in East London. Um, and I'm also doing some insight interviews and insight interviews are, I've yet to conduct all of these, but they're gonna be people who are essentially uh, influencers and people who also work in the industry of like promoting. So talking to a couple of people from Min, who's a Muslim, uh, they're kind of a Muslim influencers agency, for example. So their brands go to them to get Muslim influencers to promote their things um, and their products. And also, so probably the most uh, distinct part, and which is a bit of a nightmare ethically for me to get cleared, was coll using collaborative filmmaking um, aspects of it. And I guess at the root of that was the fact that I was, Instagram is so image led and most of my participants and myself as an avid Instagram user self publish daily using not just um, static images, but also videos and what they call reels, which are like edited little clips with music. And so for me, it seemed absolutely bizarre not to be talking about what we're talking, what my thesis is on without incorporating um, filmmaking but I wanted it to be collaborative and the reason being that you know I'm going to go to talk about this more in terms of constructing the images of Muslim women a lot of the time or at least most of the time Muslim women are totally actually left out of that discussion and so for me I didn't want to come in even though I have proximity to my example set I wanted it to be produced together um, because I think everyone has value and knowledge in this kind of thing and that means and how does that actually work out collaborative filmmaking is I'm going to obviously be doing a lot of the filming and a lot of it is observed however when it comes to editing the films um, I'm going to select some of the women to be able to come in and have a chat over and then we'll have some viewings and then we can talk about it so doing cuts that then can be and so that's kind of very much a my telly head coming in there um, to be able to give a say in and in the nuance of the messaging that happens Happens. So it's not just my representation of what young Muslim women are doing online, but also their own um, take on it. So I'm just going to briefly rattle through um, this idea of like media constructions of Muslim women. And how I've looked at it is that there are three really key motifs that we see in the representation of Muslim women online today. It's the oppressed Muslim woman, and it's that of, you know, burqa'd women in Afghanistan and, you know, even in, you know, Birmingham, who are supposedly oppressed and shackled by this archaic religion that they are bound to uphold. Um, then the second that is almost like a mirror image of that, but that is that is much more sinister and is really rooted in this kind of um, this orientalist ideology of like um, rooting Islam as like the enemy of Western um, Western liberalism and. You know, we have images, and I've used images from the news of um, Shamima Begum. Like, she didn't really dress like that all the time, but the fact is that image of a woman totally covered and shrouded is in itself inherently or can be seen when it's 
put near the words of jihad, etc., um, to be motives of kind of aggression and also the ultimate threat from within or the enemy at home. And um, less discussed, but I think amongst Muslim women, very discussed, is um, kind of the acceptable Muslim woman or the moderate Muslim woman. Um, and that woman still is kind of voiceless, um, but is a far more palatable understanding. I use Nadia, who I have great affection for, so I don't want you to think that I'm like dissing her because I think she's great. But uh, and because most recently she's actually really talked about this whole thing, but in early parts of her career, being kind of de-Muslimified. So the Muslimness about her that Nadia Jeldov talks of, this like visible aspect of her with a huge hijab on, um, talking about her faith, gets slowly ushered to the edges of her and the peripheries of her image. And all her books, you'll notice, will be talking about her British um, cooking and her British family, etc. So kind of softening her so that she is still voiceless and um, far more amenable to the Western palette and the white gaze. Um, she has since actually spoken about this stuff a bit more, but still not so much that, you know, she's never going to lose her publishing deal, for example. So, and, and not, I wouldn't want her to, but th there's these kind of tensions. And we'll talk about these tensions more as we talk about online experience and media constructions of women. And I kind of wanted to use a quote from my, um, my research, because I think it's really important to think about um, yeah, it's good to represent some data. So um, Orin, who's a 28 year old um, lawyer um, at Clifford Chance, so uh, she's a very successful young woman, um, says, I think growing up in post 77 generation as a brown visible Muslim, I felt like I had to justify my experience or I had to justify the fact that I'm a good human being. I'm brown, I'm Muslim, and I'm a good human being, but I'm a good human being despite being brown and Muslim. Um, so that's a really powerful quote, uh, and I hope it gives you an insight into how eloquent and amazing some of the women that I spoke to were. A really deep self-awareness of one's place in society and the way that Islam is deemed um, by outsiders and by the general public, and that is shaped by the media constructions. So what I argue in my thesis that, is that Muslim women are creating spaces online for themselves that allow for far more like a uh, pluralistic nuanced and also like very very diverse kind of representations of what it is to be a Muslim woman and so what you've got here is a series of images from a um online um what started as a zine actually um Amalia um, and is now one of like a really it's a really big huge um, kind of outfit and you'll see there's loads of different things from Muslim Twitter um, which is kind of a mirror of black Twitter um, along to from kind of really artistic renditions really traditional henna um, but also really actually like Islamic so it's not softened we're talking about seven duas or prayers for when your things are feeling hard so kind of this combination of this kind of wellness um, ethos that we see promoted more and more online, um, this idea of like balance and wellness and well-being and consciousness, and that being combined very, very clearly with Islamic practice. Um, so as I said, what we see online when we're thinking about magazines like Amalia and Azima, which is this whole page is just a cross section of, is that we have numerous and multifaceted representations of Muslim women. Um, and a lot of these are of the empowered Muslim women. Muslim woman, sorry. And so you'll see kind of everything from women in full hijab and full cultural wear into far more fashionable, unveiled um, representations. And it, it it's not just Arab beauty or South Asian Muslims. You've also got black women. And it's also this kind of really, really like open field for Islam being represented in a way that is, um, yeah, representative, I guess. And another thing to say is that it's very aspirational. And this feeds into the kind of whole model and the commercial model of what we think about of 
Instagram, at the end of the day, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, and everything else that's probably going to viral afterwards are, uh, and Snapchat are commercial vehicles. And so. And I'll show. Oh, hi. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jane. Tell, sorry. It's not like I can't see you. All I can see is. Yeah. This is a few more minutes, yeah? Yeah, because yeah. you're already five minutes over time. Oh, I didn't realize. I'm yeah, sorry, I'm not watching the time. My bad. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just going to quickly back up. So it's super aspirational. And so um, that's just a quote, but I can send this around later. And so just some quick conclusions. So the evolving constructions of the idealized Muslim women have a lasting impact on selfhood and understandings of themselves within their um, faith practice. Um, and these developments take them away from like things like comportment. So whether it's wearing the veil or not wearing the veil, but also on the individual. So it's about how you practice your Islam personally. Um, but that also connects really deeply with the way that community and representation work. Um, An agentic articulation of selfhood is bound in this kind of self expression and also self-growth which feed into these kind of conversations about like therapy well-being etc so i just want to say thank you and i'm so sorry for running over so i'll stop sharing that thank you thank you very much and sorry for sorry, sorry for running over you because you <laughs> couldn't see me just hear me many many thanks for this exciting an interesting contribution giving us more insights of how muslim women are depicted online so in order for us to have a productive discussion following these important impulses i am now looking forward to the response um, from dr jasjeet singh he's based at the university of leeds and an associate professor in the school of philosophy religion and the history of science his research focuses on the religious and cultural lives of South Asians in Britain with a particular focus on religious and cultural transmission and on the representation of religious minorities. Thank you very much, Dr. Thing Singh, for helping us reflect on this presentations. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, wow. <laughs> um, thanks very much, folks, for your excellent presentations. Um, so where to begin? There's so much, so much rich information and data uh, there. And it actually makes me reflect on my own journey into academia which was actually started off by images I, in fact I'll just I'll just show you some of these if that's all right um hopefully you can see you can see that so I was looking at I was looking at um images being created by have they come up by the way can everyone see those yeah, yeah. I was looking at images created by young young Sikhs uh, in diaspora uh, and I was being told in, in, in institutions I was being told that young Sikhs aren't, aren't interested in religion anymore but then I, I was seeing all this all this stuff being created online on the internet by by young Sikhs themselves and um, in particular minions caught my eye which isn't isn't surprising uh, and given that's topical at the moment with a new um, minions film just just come out it'd be interesting if, if uh, the respondents could also reflect on the impact of popular culture on the images which their particular groups that they're researching are, are producing is is there any kind of impact on popular culture and if so how does that manifest itself um, in the in the kinds of things that they find online. Also, I'm actually looking at the at the emergence of uh, the Sikh tradition online at the moment, and much of that was in fact driven by by images, uh, in particular of the of the events of of 1984. So the Sikh tradition kind of emerged online in, in the late 90s, and much of that as a consequence of the fact that it enabled people to talk about the events of 1984 in, in the Punjab, and the fact that that those had actually happened in a context where images were produced. So if those events had happened 10 years earlier, you wouldn't have had the, the news footage or the or, or the or the or the photographs as Anna showed in her, you know in her presentation too um, of, of, of newspapers. So again the, the, the relationship between um, production of images by mainstream media and their impact on the groups that, pe that people are looking at too um, would also be very welcome. And how does you know, is there a hierarchy of images, for example, where images in newspapers in terms of representation are seen as being more important than images or more, more influential than images on social media? Or, or, or is that is that now changing? You know, are, are, are images on Instagram as important for the groups that are being researched as images in mainstream media? And the issue about images is that, you know, once they once you be once you go online, other people can also 
represent groups in particular kinds of ways. So the, the control of images which may have existed within groups themselves is kind of it's kind of lost. So there, and you know, uh, you know, Robert spoke about some of these too. The 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 the, the the kind of policing, I suppose, of images and representations of communities is 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 now wide open. So this this slide is an example of a of a game which um, included Sikhs as a as terrorists in a in a in a game that was released in two thousand and five. Again, you know, not something that Sikhs were were in control of, but something that they then had to respond to because the the digital arena enabled the representations of this community in a particular kind of way. And you know, going on to um, Renasha's uh, talk in terms of representations of, of, of women, um, in, in my research I'm looking at at the moment, you know, that there's a particular kind of way in which Sikh women are represented online, which may not actually reflect the the realities on the ground. So I wondered, as well as representations of Muslim Muslim women by non-Muslims, how are Muslim women represented? Not by, not by Muslim women, but by Muslims in general would be would be a, 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 an interesting kind of question to look at too. Um, but overall, I'll just I'll just stop this. Overall, um, I was also thinking about uh, Heidi Campbell's uh, religious, what's it called again? Uh, yeah, religious social shaping of technology, which kind of asks the question about how do religious communities themselves and negotiate technology and their use of technology based on their history, tradition, core beliefs, um, and, and the framing of themselves in general. So what kinds of rules exist within the communities themselves about the kinds of images that are allowed and, uh, you know, available to be put online? And, and do adherents of these traditions follow those rules? And if not, how is the how is the use of images actually policed, if if at all? So uh, I mean, I say there's so much to um, to kind of digest from the from all the presentations. I've made I've made a few more notes. Let me just see what else I um, starred. Uh, yeah, so Im images as history in terms of the headlines and the stories and the use of newspapers and how the the, the use of images and and the kind of representations of stories in, through images as opposed to text and what the difference is uh, as a consequence of that. Um, Joseph's observation about the, the medium itself changing the meaning. So in terms of how that's actually developed over the years would be would be interesting to reflect on too and particular social media and um, echo chambers and what that actually does to representations as well. Um, oh, another point there is about in terms of the Sikh tradition, the the uh, the groups the the new religious movements that became quite influential early on were actually ones that could present information in the right sort of language so Sikhs in diaspora were looking for content in English and it was a it was a reasonably small group of Sikh um, converts in America who who were producing content in English who became very influential in the early years primarily because their content was in English so it wasn't if they as if they were a big group but the fact that their content was in English meant that they became very influential. So as well as images, just kind of the, the impact of, of language um, too. Um, oh yeah, and in terms of um, uh, Robert's presentation uh, and the use of the of, of the symbols of Milonir uh, as a hammer, having just seen Thor at the weekend. Um, and in terms of, although these images are easily accessible, the messaging, obviously they would only appear to appeal to particular groups of people who actually understand what the particular kinds of symbols mean. So some sort of um, dissection about the importance of particular symbols and how these symbols are um, transmitted to the people that they are looking to influence. And um, yeah, I think if, I think that's, I'll probably stop there. There's, there's lots I can say, but there was so much good stuff um, I probably haven't done it all. I haven't done it all justice, but I hope that's been some kind of uh, reflection of it all. And thanks again for all the presentations, guys. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think um, it's a good basis to get into the discussion. Uh, into the discussion. So I will keep an eye on the chat, and I will give you the microphone now, Suzanne, so that you can you have an eye on the request to speak. Sure. Um, I mean, do, do any of these jazz ask quite a few different questions there? Do any of the speakers want to pick up on any that particularly um, interested them? 
you can just unmute yourself yeah i you. would if i may yeah uh, it's robert um i i'd like to respond to those really stimulating points um in terms of in particular of the, the blurring of the impact of popular culture and mainstream media in heathenry with the example of um the storming of the capitol building uh in January last year, um, when a key figure that the mainstream media focused on was the so-called QAnon shaman, Jake Angeli, um, who sports three uh, Norse-inspired tattoos, um, two of which we saw on that Heathens Against White Supremacy um, Instagram post, um, two of those being um, the Valknut, which is linked to Odin and uh, Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, um, and how heathens responded to that on Instagram was very interesting because there was an immediate outrage that these images had, had been appropriated by the far right. And there were a series of posts which either used photographs of, of him um, and said, this is not my religion, um, et cetera, in very stronger terms. Um, so there was an immediate reaction, and I think that's a good, a good example of how in, in the current moment there is this blurring between mainstream media and popular culture. That's not to mention the influence of things like the Vikings and uh, Last Kingdom TV series on, on heathen users and Instagram. Um, so I'll leave that, that there. Thanks. Do any of the other speakers want to respond to any of Jazjet's um, multiple prompts? Um, yeah, so um, kind of drawing on what Robert was talking about as well, I think there is this definite thing about audiences online. And so if you're in a bubble of Muslim women looking at things around South Asian female empowerment, being more Islamically pious, um, Islamic feminism, you're going to create a feed which is curated around that. And then the algorithm from Instagram feeds even more stuff that's like that. Or if you're just into like Sylvanian families, for example, like whatever your little niche is or several niches that you have in look into, you have that. The thing with the power of pervasive about the media, and I think is this weekend there was a huge trans pride rally and there was nothing reported apart from I think the independent. Um, and, you know, I'm a huge ally. I have many friends who are trans. So for me, it's always been something that's a big part of what I follow online, particularly also because when we're talking about Islamic pluralism, the gay community um, and the queer community, um, there is a huge growth uh, and spur of kind of people who exi always existed but in terms of being represented didn't have a place to and so places like Instagram and Snapchat have allowed for you know queer Muslims to kind of coalesce to the point where now there's you know an inclusive mosque which does Eid present you know people are able to spend Eid with other people when they've otherwise been alone and so for me yeah I still fundamentally think that the broadcast media and the traditional media does sadly still dictate that kind of the nuance of pub, like the public consciousness or whatever is that, or, or they dictate it depending on how cynical you want to be. But when it comes to being online, however, you can tailor what you want. And I see from my participants, they really tailor their feed to what they want to watch or see or support or seek out if that be more syncretic understandings of Islam or if that be, you know, crocheting, you know, whatever it might be. So there is, um, and there's layers of that as well. Um, and, and it meant that for me, what I can see is this kind of, this interplay of this consciousness of what the media is saying about Muslims particularly on Muslim women, um, especially in the aftermath of huge terror attacks. And then, um, and then the, the kind of creation of what they're doing in their day-to-day -day lives online and how that kind of creates that bubble as well. So I think there's a tension there and there's always gonna be that tension, I think, as social media grows and kind of dictates more of the, the sphere of um, attention for a lot of people. 
I'm just, yeah, Joseph, I was just wondering if you had a, a comment about that tension. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'd like to uh, address this to uh, Robert uh, Wallace. Because, uh, in this article I wrote about retribing the planet, and, and I mentioned in this exit today, uh, I bring up a statement by Alice Beck Kehoe, who was, uh, wrote the book, uh, Shamans and Religion and Anthropology, and anthropological exploration of critical thinking. And uh, she's been critical of the neo-shaman movement. Uh, she wrote that neo-shamanism is racism. And by this, she meant an intellectual or ivory tower racism that looks down on and dismisses the achievements of a living ancient culture as if shamanism represents a lesser evolved human being who needs a more advanced culture to properly interpret it. Thus, the neo-shaman feels justified in appropriating techniques of shamanism and marketing them for personal profit. Uh, so, for instance, the January 6th uh, Q shaman uh, was such a character, I think he appropriated these uh, symbols uh, for his own political agenda. Maybe you could comment on that, Robert. Yeah, um, I'm in agreement with Alice Kehoe on that point. Um, in combination with the Norse imagery, Angeli was wearing um, Native American inspired costume, which of course was direct appropriation. Um, so it's uh, she's absolutely right. And that's one thing that inclusivist universalist heathens are, are rallying against in their own practice by looking to looking away from exoticized foreign cultures to the ancient past of, in quotes, their own heritage. Um, but at the same time, in, in interesting and problematic ways, redeploying shamanistic themes from scholarship within their own religion. So there has been a, um, a, a lot written about the practice of savor or shamanistic type sorcery in, in Norse sources and how that's been reused by contemporary heathens often in ways which are, um, are interesting and empowering in terms of disrupting conventional stereotypes of, of gender and sexuality, for example. So there are, it's a mixed, it's a very mixed bag of, of how these cultural trapping, trappings, either from the past or from indigenous cultures are being used and reinterpreted. Yeah, thanks. There's another question for you, Robert, in the chat box. Yeah, I got it. I just, just read it then. Um, oh, that's absolutely right. I, I'm afraid that in the 10 minutes, didn't have time to go into Declaration 27, uh, 127 and how um, heathens, uh, particularly in the US, but also internationally and in bringing heathens across the globe together um, in Frith Forge and Heathens United Against Racism and other conferences and fora which have been about um, challenging racism in, in heathenry and finding ways to broaden the culture. So yeah, thanks very much for, for flagging that. Um, that's going to be in the book. <laughs> um, I think someone's asked me a question. Should I go for it or at least I'll respond to it? I don't know if anyone wants Go for it. To. So we're talking about um, Thank you, Joshua. Um, talking about is there a downside of the bubbles that I was just talking about and the curation of the feed that I was talking about that a lot of people do. I think um, fundamentally that you still don't lose what you're calling about that shared bank of images. You're inundated and have been in terms of the way you're acculturated from adulthood. I mean, Instagram's only been around for 10 years and only in the last five years would I say it was picked up to the level of kind of uh, where it's a part of people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, I would still say that that shared bank of effective images, um, and it, I don't know exactly what you mean there, but in terms of shared visual culture, I think these women that I'm speaking to, or at least from talking from even my own experience, that we still grow up with the same shared 
images or you know co co common cultural kind of language and markers and messaging um so i think i don't feel like people are losing stuff from having curated feeds that give them what they want from their online or social media experience the one thing that i will say as well just as a last point is that for a lot of the women that i spoke to being online and being on instagram um because of the way that it works there's a whole explore page which though is worked through the algorithm is still fed through what pays the most to be on a feed so when it comes to explore pages which is uh, you know there's this whole new toggle for it on the on the interface um that you're offered images and videos of things that you won't necessarily um choose yourself and one quote really hits me from one of my participants, Jasmine. She talks about, and I'm allowed to say their names, by the way, that's the way my ethical clearance was given, is that she says that before Instagram, she's like in her late, she's nearly 30 now, that she, she without Instagram, she wouldn't have realized that the kind of the, how much of the world there is out there. She's now an avid traveler and she travels alone, which is a big, still relatively quite a big taboo in the Bangladeshi diaspora and actually a lot of South Asians I think that still marks for traditional homes so um being able to access things online it sounds so bizarre but if you grow up in quite a tight-knit community like Tower Hamlets is um where which is pretty deprived as well access to uh, like things like holidays and stuff so isn't that common so online um is a way of being able to access kind of everything that's out there I hope I've answered some of your questions And like I said, the bubble isn't just like this limited thing. It's not like this one highway you're on. Um, you still have access to kind of all the multiplicity of Muslim cyclers or like, you know, whatever, or bakers or whatever you're thinking about. So it's never just this kind of, that's the beauty of online stuff is that I express myself as a Muslim female scholar in a way and all my other friends who are doing similar work across the country do express their online presences in a totally different way and so that's the whole point I think that's the beauty of the online expression is that it is so personal and it is so nuanced. So if anyone wants to um, I've got some more questions here a question for Jackie. Have you compared Western and Indian representations of yoga on Instagram? Are there any moves taking place regarding the ownership of yoga online? Uh, hello, and yes, uh, a little, and uh, not not thoroughly, like in um, in terms of research project, but certainly, um, what one thing that I thought didn't come up. Um, it certainly is an issue within the yoga sphere, if you like, on, on social media platforms. And I don't know if it comes up for others who presented here, but it's very much that debate of ownership and also targeted, um, uh, what might you say, targeted activism in a um, hit group type manner. So if there's a particular, um, aspect of yoga culture that seems to be up for debate, whether it's being appropriated by Western culture or, um, you know, or say, for example, um, gay yoga that may be not in keeping with some belief systems or religious practitioners within yoga, within Indian yoga, there may be um, forms of attack that take place online and in the yoga in the online yoga sphere and I wondered whether other um, presenters have come across that it's not something that I'm that I'm currently studying but it's certainly something that I'm having conversations with people <coughs> excuse me about this because actually a few people have approached me about what to do how to how to handle it some people are handling it through complete blockage so they stop um, block block accounts from from tracking them um, others engage, but then they perhaps suffer um, uh, suffer attack, uh, particularly in the world of Twitter, or in other cases, people have to form alliances with others who will come in and help support them in these times of 
sort of volatile moments <laughs> when when subjects get debated. So yes, that certainly is um, something that comes up in the yoga world, how it's represented and used within India. This is a whole new field, I think, of study. It would be fantastic if someone was looking at that particular area. Um, there is certainly lots of crossover. So we have researchers looking at um, yoga done by sadhus and in India, and they all have iPhones now. So they're very much influenced by what's in the feed and what's um, you know, being popular, what's being hashtagged, and they'll perform it um, you know, to get more followers and be in communication with people on things like what, um, what, um, WhatsApp. Uh, so yeah, it's a really dynamic and intercultural space uh, online, which I think is actually quite fantastic, but it means it's really fast moving. And so it's hard to keep on top of all areas at once. Um, so there's lots, lots going on there. Thank you. Andrew's got an interesting question about Evola and, and questionable um, radical right. What, what, what is quite interesting um, is we've been looking at the Slavic Aryan Vedas um, and kind of a pagan Hindu right potential overlaps recently. I think that's kind of an area to watch. Um, I was wondering about the creative aspects of that. Um, uh, uh, several speakers mentioned when people are, are curating their own spaces on Instagram and kind of come up with self-identity and also the the creative space of healing through arts if through through trauma and how and the tension between that and the the kind of consuming and sucking in maybe presentations that um, Anna presented at the begin with of uh, to begin with of, of like you you want to present this image um, to attract people to gather followers um, and yeah, there's just something about attention there. And I wonder if any of the speakers could reflect on it a bit more in their in their specific research areas. Sorry, uh, Suzanne, could you just explain your question again? Yeah, wasn't... no, fair enough. I'm not sure if I was very clear. There seems to be a tension between an, a kind of active creative um, element to um, expressing and um, redefining your own identity, whether it's as a religious person or as having left a uh, religious movement, um, which is also kind of competing in the same space as um, uh, a kind of desire to gain followers and, and present a certain um, curated uh, image to draw other people in. Um, and I, I don't know that there's a question. I just find that tension really interesting. I was wondering if anyone had something slightly more intelligent to say about it than I did. I, I um, actually, something comes to mind when you talk about this tension. It definitely exists. And when it comes to the, um, sorry, I'm just going to turn the fan off that I've got on because it's very whirring for the recording that's not very good um is that uh there is this massive tension so when it comes to early social media media influences so this idea of like so uh islamic lifestyle influences so a lot of them were young muslim women um british muslim women and american muslim so in the west predominantly speaking english on youtube doing modest like hijab um tutorials and also makeup tutorials right and these women were amazing because what they did was they shift the conversation about what it is to be a muslim woman from the male you know scholarly if you want to call it that but essentially the male gaze to about women dressing for women but in a way that is modest and still prescriptive to whatever realms of islam that they kind of wanted so a lot of them were sunni muslims and kind of observed hijab in quite a traditional way and yet were making it really fashion forward right so they were wearing western clothing but wearing it in a way and kind of making it functional for themselves fast forward to where we are now and a couple of years ago you had some of these kind of they were shining lights they're pioneers in that truest sense of it and they a lot of them essentially ended up taking off their hijabs and, and many of the women that I spoke to and I had a cross-section of people who were like wearing veil uh, or not wearing veil and varying levels of um, Islamic practice amongst that group, across that group. Um, and 
everyone talked about Dina Tokyo and Asia, and these were the kind of the people that I'm talking about, taking off the hijab. And the biggest criticism was this whole thing of like, well, you used us and you created a space that you needed because the whole thing with online, it doesn't exist without the, the consumers. And there's that whole prosumer, so the consumer and producer becoming one, right? So the content creators create what their audience want to watch. And a lot of the time they're asking, what would you like me to do next? And they're told. So there's there's a really kind of ambiguous relationship between the audience and the uh, and and the the creative as it were. Um, and when a lot of the women decided to, uh, you know, when I say a lot, like I, I count on more than my fingers than that of like influencers and less influential influencers, but not massive ones who took their hijab off in the name of personal choice, in the name of it no longer serves my understanding of Islam and, you know, totally respectable choices. That fundamentally, there was this big betrayal. And that was the word that came up a lot, not just for hijab wearing, veil wearing women, but also for um, non hijab wearing women who are like, I can understand how my hijabi friends feel because for the first time and it comes down to what one of the big questions I think that we talked about in the, was posed in the seminar this idea of how does visual culture kind of allow for um representations of like I can't remember exactly how it was worded yeah what role does the visual have on contemporary religious identification and practice and for these women it gave them in the early days and this is within the cloud of Islamophobia that still exists and was sparked about 20 years ago is that it gave them valency it gave them a sense of being seen and being able to be seen now the politics of representation is muddy water because not everyone can be you know uh, some someone on a pedestal who is there and I think that's the kind of personal texture that social media and influence influencer life allows for but there was a definitely redefinition of what it was to be a Muslim influencer and there's definitely a lot of tension and trolling and all this kind of stuff that goes with and also inherent misogyny that's still all over the internet and isn't precluded on the Islamic web so um that's my really long answer <laughs> sorry <laughs> That's a great answer. Thank you. So I think I, I can contribute something because um, to answer your question or try to answer, I think what is the problem with such I, what I would call them in my dissertation kind of kind of charismatic images is that what is shown on the images, um, I, I showed you the, the images of the shearing groups, um, what is shown must be sustained that can um, from my observation, put a lot of pressure on individual movements, especially in cowboy churches. It's a problem when members find out that they're not only there to ride horses and wear a cowboy hat, but also have to pray. And there was one moment when the pastor said, okay, we are not just here for horse riding. Otherwise I could put, put a sign up where it says subtle club. And then the members were so shocked. And one member said, okay, but it's a cowboy church. We're wearing the hat and it's like, the building is built like a ranch. And I think that's that's a big problem when you have kind of an image or uh, image or something material on the on the on the internet which shows what you are. And then kind of you have to engage like in the movement as well. It's not like everything is shiny. And I think that's a little bit so a little bit tricky for the movements, especially for corporate treasures, and I think for Church of Scientology too. So we should kind of um, remember that. I'm guessing Jackie can say something about imagery and yogic context and how it traps and liberates. Yeah. Well, I, I was actually going to come back to your question about the tension between creation and religiosity. And this, um, certainly within the yoga sphere, I find that actually, and I don't know if this also comes up in other areas, is people having multiple identities on social media. So um, it's not restricted to a single account, that they actually have um, multiple personas. And this 
enables not only greater reach, but then they have more control over their feeds. But it also means that um, when you bump up against these tensions of identity, um, they can switch to a different person, if you like, and if they've had enough of that, that particular type of community. Um, so this is interesting because not everyone knows that they're doing that. Um, and uh, But if you follow multiple people and you happen to come across it, then you, then you see um, that there can be this contradiction. Um, and it's also a space for creativity. And, and this stems from like a really long ideas of what the internet was and, and a, anonymity, anonymity, I think, like we on the internet previously, you could be completely anonymous and your identity could be an avatar of some sort. This is sort of coming back, if you like, through um, these social media forms. Um, but in the yoga space, it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I don't know, I sort of see, see that particularly in intentions as people evolve because it's a long um, development of people's relationship with pe either either traditions or traditions that have a, a cultish nature that suffer an abuse expo um, exposure then they need to rebrand and so people are constantly and malleably changing their identity on uh, in these fields I just had another thought that came up as well about the tensions of the way that social media works as a commercial enterprise and it being like really capitalistic and the fact that a lot of uh, the way that Islam and particularly like black Islam and the influence of black Islam on kind of uh, current like younger generations, the way they're thinking about Islam is inherently kind of anti-capitalistic, anti-racist anti you know so uh, an anti-establishment fundamentally and a lot of my participants actually are a part of abolitionist groups as well and do like kind of courses and training on that a couple of them do that and some people are just like learning about it so there's this huge tension also when we're thinking about images of muslim women at the end of the day these influencers despite kind of pronouncing this idea of like the modern muslim woman she's usually an influencer a businesswoman whatever like creative and then she's also a a mother has an amazing kitchen which she cooks in for her four children and her husband and they had the perfect wedding and like all this kind of it's still really prescriptive in terms of the gender expectations of of muslim women and also just generally women i think will stop so it's still this um there's this really big tension amongst women being like well they're just still kind of peddling the same old um and even though some people will say those are islamic um, uh, rights that women should be upholding, that in many ways what they are reproducing is capitalistic. Um, this whole idea of like work-life balance, which inherently is a capitalist idea, um, but also white supremacists when it comes to the type of beauty images that are being constantly issued, um, kind of recycled, um, you'll find most people are white passing. Um, when I say white passing, uh, have proximity to whiteness either by being mixed heritage or just light skinned. And so all the kind of challenges that has in um, trying to uh, fully aware, feeling like you're seeing yourself represented because you've got a South Asian woman who's Muslim talking about all the multiplicity of kind of what that is. And then they're still pushing as the homeware and um or you know tesco clothing the other day i saw dina kind of doing and it's kind of it's bizarre because it's all product placed and so sometimes that authenticity that we're talking about online gets muted by the commercial project Yeah, and, and I would like to add that we should not forget that through the internet or Insta and Instagram or websites, whatever, the authorities shift. That's what Heidi Campbell stated. We have suddenly bloggers and webmasters are in a posi position to change the image in a way of a religion by putting certain images online, especially regarding Islam and Buddhism, because as I said before, images have a kind of certain efficacy, and that's interesting as well. 
Yeah, and, and a lot of the criticisms, just to add on to that, Anna, I think it's really, it is, you're so right, it's, it is about it all being for the white gaze. And you know, what you'll find with a lot of, um, not necessarily explicitly Islamic content makers, but these like cultural content makers who are not just female, but also male, but happen to be Muslim, it's all for the white gaze and the criticisms online. And yet everyone's still consuming it because it's the most sophisticated content. And it's still nice to see people talking about culture in a way that isn't just mainstream white, but it is for the white gaze completely. So it's, it's very muddled and very complex. But one thing I will say is that users are very, very aware of those complexities. It's not something that's subconscious that they're like being fed. All my participants who are very different, some of them, um, all are really aware of the, the, the platform and how it works and how they're being fed stuff. And, and yet there's this complacency of like, but can't not have it, you know, as well. So there's that tension as well. Is that because of your, um, your cohort, like your millennial cohort? Do you think that changes um, generationally? Yeah, I think what, what I saw, because it's such a big cohort, despite it being one generational group, um, I found that there is a generational shift in the way that this is consumed and the way that that, I think everyone has a, the same perception of the kind of slightly sinister aspects of the way that Instagram, Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, Meta, whatever they're called now, all kind of control messaging and imaging and the way it's done. However, there is this distinct, um, in a weird way, there's this acceptance with older participants of the way they engage with it is very soft touch, but they're happy to accept the sinister side of it. Whereas my younger participants were like far more critical but also rejecting sometimes of the of the nature of the beast as it were like they, they are far more up for rejecting influences that no longer are doing the you know the job that they felt they were which was quite actually quite spiritual for a lot of the people that I spoke to and the moment that that dropped off they were like I'm not going to follow her anymore um so there's a lot more of uh, that disparity sure so we've got time for uh, like one or one or two more questions, maybe one. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, I'll go, go on in. <laughs> yeah, go on then. <laughs> well, seeing as we've got such a diverse group of speakers, I, I, I wondered if we could possibly compare the um, profiles of influencers if possible if i mean is is there you know do, do, do you have a sense of the um age gender migratory history class of 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 influences in each of the various groups that you've um examined is that who is that too is that to everyone <laughs> Well, in, in, in the yoga, it's sort of white Western women, generally speaking. Uh, that's how it comes across. And it's also sort of data-wise, seems to be actually a bit older than the millennial group. So heading towards um, mid-40s or 40s to 35, uh, it pid. Um, however, I would say that actually um, that's often because... Um, cultural expressions or where these groups are shared is not the same type of media. And this is where it's a little bit hard to penetrate what's happening. So for example, in the China market where WeChat or something is more um, a area of shared uh, community in particularly in the yoga space, rather than using something like Instagram. Um, so it really depends on the media in which you're analyzing. Um, uh, but I, I do find that there's a different, with influencers, it's more like an idealized form of what it, I, I guess it sort of comes up a little bit with um, Renish's idea of the media, 
it's like an idealized form of what yoga looks like if it's embodied. And that's why the white Western woman kind of gets the product placement. But that doesn't necessarily mean that reflects the community at all. And that's what's really interesting. So the diversity of conversation and the diversity of practice, as well as who's doing what, is really um, global and diverse. And that's what's not reflected in those that are sort of <laughs> um, receiving the, the income, if you like. Yeah. So when it comes to the Church of Scientology, um, they are using every medium. So they're using TikTok, Instagram, websites. They're using everything. So there's a medium for every age group. So, but, but when, it, when it comes to studying or um, the belief system, in the end, it's important that you read the books. Uh, they have books and in the books, there are images as well. So kind of, the, the, the medium or the images or the TikTok videos, whatever, they are somehow there to, I mean, I'm just doing my research, so I cannot answer these questions right now, but they're kind of to con conserve this whole community to be like a network. That's what they're written on the website. We are a network. So they're using everything. And that's kind of, but when you go to the Church of Scientology, there are still the old books they have to study. So. Do you want to make any closing comments, Robert, about your demographics? Um, yeah. Um, well, Heathenry is very diverse. Um, all the platforms are used. I have only been focusing on Instagram um, and websites, um, but the, the of all the pagan paths, it could be argued to be the the most bookish um, because so many of the texts survive in the original languages um, and also archaeological because of the rich sources that exist there. Um, so as such, a, a, many heathens are quite highly informed about the historic and archaeological material. Um, and that then feeds into um, the new media platforms in encouraging practitioners and, and people new um, to explore those sources rather than to go to um, more recent books for their information so as to avoid the more extremist material, which is interesting. Fantastic. So we've reached the end of our two hours of um, conversation, but um, I feel like we've just started a conversation and there's so much more interesting things to be said and done. Um, do you want to say anything in closing, Anna? Yeah, I just want to thank you all for this, um, for the great presentations and for the interesting discussion. And yeah, and I hope we can can keep in touch and discuss our topics. And I hope to see everyone to the next seminar. <laughs> Fantastic. I hope everyone has a good evening and um, a good summer. And we'll see you again in the autumn for another informed seminar. <laughs>